Welcome to the Central Church YouTube channel. We hope that today's message blesses you in some way. Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to stay current with all the content we put online. Thanks again for being with us, and remember, you are loved at Central. All right, if you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and open it up or turn it on and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we will be Today, we're going to pick up right where we left off uh, last week. And as Ali said, we're going to spend some time this morning thinking about unity in the church. Now, Rudolph, or Rudy Dossler, was born in 1898 to young parents uh, in a small German manufacturing town. Uh, two years later, his brother Adolf, or uh, Adi as he was called, uh, he was born in 1900. And the two brothers, Rudy and Adi, they would go on to found one of the most successful sport shoe manufacturing companies in Germany in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And what put them on the map was uh, Adi's vision for a running shoe that had spikes in it. Uh, now, uh, we know today that this is fairly common in track and field. At least some of you do. I wasn't a runner, right? Uh, I didn't run track and field. That's shocking, I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Adi uh, Dossler was the first one to come up with this idea. And so the German Olympic track and field coach, uh, he took Adi's idea uh, and he ended up contracting with the Dossler brothers uh, to begin uh, creating this shoe that then spread like wildfire through Germany and throughout the rest of the world. And they would go on to make uh, baseball cleats and uh, football cleats and soccer cleats and any other kind of sport shoe that you could imagine. And now the Dossler brothers, their company was on the rise until World War II. When World War II hit, the, the war started to create some new tensions in Germany, which led to tensions between the brothers. And so at the end of the war, the brothers decided that their division, their tension was just too great. And they decided to take the Dossler Brothers Sports Shoe Company and divide it in half. Uh, and so as they negotiated over uh, who would get what, uh, Adi got to keep two-thirds of the employees and the, the manufacturing plant, uh, while Rudy had to go south of the town and build a new plant with some of the employees. Uh, they, uh, they haggled over this, they, they negotiated it, and this negotiation would be the last time the brothers would ever speak. See, division and bitterness controlled Rudy and Adi to the very end, to the point that today uh, they died in the 70s. Rudy is buried on one side of the cemetery and Adi is buried on the other side of the cemetery. Now, the two companies that Rudy and Adi founded, they continue today. Uh, Adi took his name and paired it with part of his last name and created a company called Adidas, or what we call today Adidas. Uh, Rudy would go on to found a company uh, that would change names about halfway through the time he led it, uh, and he wanted to find something a little more athletic, and so today we know that company as Puma. Uh, see, division and bitterness uh, rarely lead to good things. Right? Division and bitterness uh, are never really a blessing. Right, They're never really something that we, uh, we enjoy. None of us woke up this morning and said, hey, you know what? I could really use a great dose of bitterness today. Right? Uh, none of us woke up thinking, man, I would really like to divide something. Right? If you're like me, I woke up thinking I would really like to divide that waffle. Right? Or those pancakes or something like that. Like I said, I'm not a runner. I, know I don't run track and field. Now see, division between brothers is tragic, and division with anyone is always sad, and it's almost always avoidable. And so where we come to Ephesians 4 this morning, Paul has just given this great doxology, right? We, we read that last week. We looked at that last week. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul comes out of that doxology and where does he go? He goes right to unity. See, Paul's writing to encourage the Ephesians in their unity. He's calling them to know this truth. A united church is a God-centered church. A united church is a God-centered church. 
Look with me at Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the verses on the screen. But let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's perfect and precious word here in Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1, the Spirit says to us this morning, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is God's word. You can be seated. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we want to honor you today. God, I pray that you would lead us to worship as we look at your word. Father, I pray that as we study your word together this morning, that we would be conformed into the image of Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you would do now what only you can do. Let's apply your word to our hearts and to our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we look at Ephesians chapter 4 and we think about unity, Paul's going to give us kind of two big ideas, two truths to look at this morning in this passage. The first truth is this. First, we see what unity looks like. What unity looks like. Now, some things are easier to describe than define, right? That's what Paul's doing here. Uh, I grew up in a small town, and one of the things about growing up in a small town is when you need to tell someone how to get somewhere, you don't give them an address, right? You say, you remember the, the gas station that used to be there next to the tree? You get under the tree that you put the gum on and you take a right right? Uh, and, and we laugh, but like everyone knows what I was just talking about, right? If you grew up in Keystone Heights, then you know that I just gave you directions to the high school, right? Uh, Paul here, he, he doesn't give us an address, right? He doesn't say that if you want unity, you've got to do this, this, and this, right? Instead, he gives us a description of what unity looks like. And what he's doing is he's stressing the importance of unity in the church and he's showing us, what does a united church look like? In fact, I think that we could rightly say that he's showing us, what does a church member who encourages and strives for unity, what does that church member look like? Amen. Amen. See, if a united church is a God-centered church, then here he's showing us what a God-centered church and a God-centered church member looks like. Now, where we pick up here in verse 4, or in chapter 4, verse 1, what we're coming to is we're coming to a transition moment in the book of Ephesians. So we've already said Paul goes through this great doxology, and then he says, I therefore. Now, when you see therefore, you know what to do. You ask, what is the therefore, therefore, right? That word therefore is always, or typically, marking a transition in an argument in Scripture, and so in the first three chapters of Ephesians, what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, these are truths to hold on to. And these are things that you must know. What he's doing is he's giving us what we call indicatives, right? That this is the truth. And then in chapter, verse 1 of chapter 4, this is the pivot statement. The first three chapters are what is true. The next three chapters are, now what do you do in light of that? So if the first three chapters are indicatives, then the last three chapters are imperatives. What Paul's doing is he's saying, look, because of all of this, because all of this is true, do this. That's right. right? Because all of this is true, let this be true of you. Now, the good news here for us and the way that the Bible works, the way that God's economy works, is that God never says to do this so that you can have that, right? Well, what Paul has done is he has spent three chapters explaining the gospel, right? He, he has spent three chapters explaining grace in the believer's life. And so what Paul's doing is he's saying, look, because of all of the grace that you have received, because of all of the grace that I have received, do this be this, live in light of that, right? And so we've got this transition statement, this transition sentence. And Paul says that he's a prisoner for the Lord, right? We saw last week that Paul's writing from a prison cell. 
But what's encouraging for me anyway is that Paul isn't deterred. He's not discouraged in his love for the gospel or the church. Really, it seems like Paul's love for the gospel and Paul's love for the Ephesians has really intensified as he's been in prison, right? It's been refined. And so in verse one, we have why Paul is writing. He's urging the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In other words, he's urging them to live a life that reflects the gospel. Right To live a life that looks like the gospel. Because it's one thing to come in here and to sing songs and to hear a sermon preached. It's another thing to go out and to live what we've heard. Right? It's one thing to come in here and to say that, hey, we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. But it is something completely different to hear that in here and then to go live that. Right? That's why we say that you have come to church. Now go be the church. Going and being the church is living a life that reflects the gospel. It's living a life that reflects the grace that you have been given. And so what does this life look like? Well, look at verses two and three with me. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So what does this look like? It looks like a life lived with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Now, what's interesting here, right, is Paul doesn't give us a list of behaviors. He gives us a list of virtues, right? Humility is a virtue, not a behavior. Gentleness is a virtue, not a behavior. It's something that I say to my kids all the time is that patience is overrated, right? No, patience is a virtue, right? So he doesn't give us a list of behaviors. He gives us a list of virtues. And this is important because these aren't surface level behaviors, but this is a heart level change, right? Paul's not saying, hey, modify your behavior. No, what he's saying is your heart, your life has been changed by the gospel. So be humble and gentle. Have patience, love one another, maintain the unity. And so he begins this list. He says, with humility and gentleness. Now, he connects humility and gentleness as very close, right? He doesn't say with humility and with gentleness. He says with humility and gentleness. Now, humility has this idea of modesty. Now, in Paul's day, humility wasn't a virtue to be celebrated. It was an insult, right? So if someone said, wow, you're acting really humble, that wasn't a time for you to pat yourself on the back, right? That was a time for you to fight, right? That that was a time for you to be angry because humility wasn't something to be celebrated. It it was something to push back against. And so what Paul's writing here is really countercultural, right? In, In his day and in our day as well, right? We live in the day of social media, Right. Uh, And uh, if you spend much time on social media, then you'll know that that people like to post pictures uh, so that they can get likes or so they can get shares or they can get whatever it might be. Right. And and so people are tempted that, hey, I'm going to make my life look really good. Right. We all know social media isn't real life. Right. It's curated life. Right. I posted a picture yesterday of uh, myself and my son. And we were super happy because the Gators were about to play a team from Tuscaloosa. Right. Uh, We were super excited. Now, if you notice, I didn't push a picture after the game. Right. I only wanted you to see before the game. I didn't want you to see after the game. Right. Humility is something that we've got to fight for. He says humility and gentleness. Gentleness, that's this idea of meekness. Right. The blessed are the meek. Gentleness is this idea of not being overly impressed with yourself. And I think what's true is that really the rest of verses two and three really flow from this first humility and gentleness. Next, he says, with patience and with bearing with one another in love. One of the things I've learned is that you can't have patience if you're not humble, right? You can't bear with one another in love if you're not humble. And the word that he uses for patience here, it really carries with it this idea, the ability to suffer for a reason. And so when Paul says here in chapter four and verse two, he says to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with patience. He's saying walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called in a way that you can suffer well, right? 
And most of us probably aren't excited about that verse, right? But that's what Paul says, a life lived according to the gospel, a life that reflects the gospel is a life that reflects the gospel, not just when we're walking in blessing, but also maybe when we're walking in pain. Uh, also maybe when we're walking in suffering. He says, bearing with one another in love. Now notice, this isn't just tolerating one another, right? Uh, like, I don't like you, but I'll tolerate you. No, Paul says, don't just tolerate, but love each other, right? Love that other church member. Love that other brother. Love that other sister. He says, bearing with one another. This, this idea of bearing with one another, it, it carries with it uh, this idea of being in it for the long haul. Right? That I'm not just going to love you today. I'm not just going to love you tomorrow. I'm not just going to love you for a week or two weeks. But no, I'm going to love you for eternity because God is going to love me for eternity. Right? And the same love with which I've been loved is the same love that I'm called to love others with. And he, he says that he, you're eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. See, where these things are present, there will be an urgency of maintaining the unity of the Spirit. Now, that word unity, it means oneness. It means walking in harmony or accord with someone else. And notice what he says there in verse 3. He says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. He doesn't say to create unity or to develop unity. No, he says maintain unity. See, the Holy Spirit creates unity in the church. Our sin harms the unity, right? What we, what you and I add to our unity as believers, as brothers and sisters, is only what detracts from our unity. We're not called to create unity. We're not called to add unity. No, we're called to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, when we practice humility, we're on track for unity, Here's the truth. Division is easy, but unity takes work. Division is easy, but unity takes work, right? We can find any reason to divide from other people from, right? Well, I don't like the way they do that, or, or, or I don't like the way they do this, or, or, or I'm not crazy about this, or, or I'm not crazy about that. And so, you know what? I'm just not going to have anything to do with them, right? I, I don't like that they like this, right? I don't like that they do that. Now, division can take on different forms. Maybe it starts as a, a quick word in the hallway. And then maybe it grows to great issue with believers. And so here, here, here's a question for us. Who gets glory from a divided church? It's not God, right? Satan delights in dividing churches, right? And so our question is, are we, are we going to be a tool of unity or division? Or to put it a little more bluntly, are we going to be a tool of the Father or a tool of the enemy? Right? Are we going to be a tool of God or a tool of Satan? I right, see, God doesn't get glory in a divided church. God gets glory in a united church that reflects the gospel to a world that is perishing. Right? God gets glory whenever we come in this room together or whenever we go and we serve our community together and people see us serving, not because we look the same or because we act the same or because we're the same age or the same this or the same that. No, God gets glory whenever legacy adults are serving with our students. Right? God gets glory when, when our white brothers and sisters are serving with our black brothers and sisters. God gets glory whenever the rich and the poor, the weak and the strong, or whatever it may be. Right? God gets glory in unity, not division. Amen. Now, there's a time to divide, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But what we need to know is that we've got to fight to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Right? That's what you and I need. Right? If we want to be a God-centered church, then we have to fight for, we have to maintain unity in our church. Amen. It's interesting that Jesus never says, blessed are the dividers. Right? <laughs> the New Testament never lists division or criticism as a fruit of the Spirit. Right? <laughs> Typically in a church business meeting, we don't say, brother so-and-so, stand up and lead us in a word of criticism. Right? <laughs> But we do read in the Sermon on the Mount things like, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be sons of God. 
Romans 12, Paul tells us that as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men, right? As far as it depends on you. Your responsibility isn't to make other people love you. Your responsibility is to love them. And so are we eager to maintain unity in the church? Or are we intentionally or not harming the unity of the church? And so how do we maintain unity in the church? I think there's two ways. There's more than that, but two ways that we'll look at this morning. First is this, is that we pray for it. We pray for unity in the church. And so here's my question for you this morning. Do you regularly pray for Central? Do you regularly pray for our church? If God answered every prayer that you've prayed for Central over the last year, how would our church be different? What would our church look like? See, this is one reason for our 21 days of prayer and fasting is because we believe that prayer works, right? In fact, we don't believe that we pray before we work. We believe that prayer is the work because God is ultimately the one who does this, right? God is ultimately the one who builds this thing. And so if you are not uh, tracking with us in our 21 days of prayer and fasting, let me just encourage you to do that, right? To pick up one of those guides on the way out. Uh, now, we talked about prayer, right? But what about fasting? You might say, Ethan, I'm not a great faster, right? I'm, I'm fasting from fasting. I've been doing it for years. It's, it's worked wonderfully, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe, maybe that's you. But hey, I've been so encouraged over the last week uh, to hear uh, stories, particularly uh, from our legacy adults, about the things that they are giving up, that they are fasting from over however long, because they love our church, right? P- people are giving up, uh, hey, I'm not going to eat dessert for the next three weeks, or, or I'm not going to drink sweet tea, or I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to do that. Now, may- maybe fasting for you looks like giving up eating for a day for 24 hours, Maybe it means giving up one thing or another. Maybe you've got some health reasons that you can't fast uh, for an entire day or you can't fast from food. If you grab that guide and you flip to the back, we've got ideas on ways that you can fast. And maybe it's fasting from social media, right? Our world would be a much better place if Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram died, right? Uh, and so maybe, maybe it's fasting from social media. Maybe it's fasting from this or from that. And so we pray for unity in the church. And next, the next way we maintain unity in the church is we believe the gospel. Believe that the gospel is for you and believe that the gospel is for everyone else. This means reminding yourself over and over and over again that you're far more broken than you could imagine, but you are far more loved in Christ than you could ever dream. All right, we die to ourselves daily and we assume the best in others. When we remember the gospel, we're reminded that if our God can be patient with us, if God can be patient with me, then I can be patient with you, right? If God can be patient with me in the way that I mess up, in the way that I fall short, in the way that I offend his holiness every single day, then I can be patient with you uh, who maybe inconveniences me in one way or another. See, United Church is a God-centered church. We see what unity looks like. Next, we see this, where unity comes from. See, unity doesn't happen by accident. We don't stumble into it. Our unity comes from God and we maintain it. See, we maintain our unity by being a God-centered church. Not an Ethan-centered church, not a you-centered church, not a, not a pastor-centered church or a worship or a music-centered church or, or a this-centered church. Or that. No, a God-centered church. Amen. See, our unity as a church comes from God. In other words, the strength of our unity is directly related to our dependence on God. Amen. So the strength of our unity as a church is directly related to your individual and my individual dependence on the Father. See, God is what gives life to us as a church, and he's the reason that we do what we do. In these last three verses of Ephesians 4, Paul is going to give us a vision of unity that is built on the Trinity. He's going to give us a picture of Trinitarian unity. He starts with the spirit and he moves to the son and then it climaxes, it hits its crescendo with the father. So in verse four, we read that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the hope that belongs to your call. 
This one body is, we are one body in the church, right? As the church, we are one body with many members and each member plays a different role, but ultimately we are one and we are one because we have been given one spirit and that one spirit is the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit gives us, calls us to one hope and that hope is in the gospel. See, in the first three chapters, Paul has argued that Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ. And so that there's no longer Jew or Gentile. Now they have come together. They have made one new man. And so now the, the hope that the Jews have is the same hope that the Gentiles have. And the same hope that the Gentiles have is the same hope that the Jews have. In the Ephesian church, there's questions about how united uh, are the Jews and the Gentiles. How, how does this work? And Paul says here, he says, look, you are one body with one spirit, with one hope. And now maybe today we don't have Jews and Gentiles uh, kind of trying to figure out how are we united as a church, but we've got different believers from different backgrounds and different stages and different ages. And maybe we're wondering, well, how can we have unity in a church with so much diversity? We have unity in a church with so much diversity by trusting Jesus and leaving it to the father to build. Right? That's where our unity comes from. And so in verse 5, Paul moves from the Holy Spirit to Jesus. Look at verse 5. He says, We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, when Paul says one Lord, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And anytime you see in the New Testament uh, someone refer to Jesus as Lord, then what you need to know is that is much a political statement as a theological statement. Because in Ephesus, uh, the Ephesians, they would say that Caesar is Lord, but then they would also say that Artemis is Lord. Artemis was kind of the, uh, the, the false god, the patron god of that city. And so people would say Caesar is Lord and Artemis is Lord. And notice that Paul says, Paul doesn't just say that Jesus is Lord. He says that we have been given one Lord. And that one Lord isn't Caesar. That one Lord isn't Artemis. That one Lord is Jesus right, is the son who has accomplished our redemption. He says we have one faith. And when he talks about one faith here, he's talking about what do we believe? He's talking about our theology, our doctrine. See, many commentators believe that when Paul says this one spirit and one Lord and one God, that he's really kind of giving the, the beginnings of an early church creed. And he's building it off of these, uh, the three different persons of the Godhead. That that's kind of the outline that this creed would hold. If that's true, and, and I think it is, then what Paul's doing is he's lifting up the theology of the church as something to unite around. It is something to hold fast to. And so what that means is that we hold tight to our theology. And see, we have been called to be a people of grace and truth. And not one or the other. So we can't sacrifice grace for truth and we can't sacrifice truth for grace. We have to be a people, we have to be a church of grace and truth. Amen. As Christians, we're called to be people of the truth. Now this means that there are times when it's right to divide. Now too often we divide over the wrong things, right? Uh, if we're honest, uh, then... There are a lot of differences that we can tolerate, right? Uh, there are a lot of things that we don't have to agree on, but we can still be united in, right? And maybe say, Ethan, well, well, when do you think Jesus is coming back, right? Whenever he wants to. I, 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 uh, I don't know, right? We can disagree over, over that. But when it comes to certain truths, we've got to hold them tightly with closed handed fists. So when it comes to whether or not Jesus is coming back, he is. Right? When it comes to, is Jesus God? He is. When it comes to the inerrancy and the truthfulness of Scripture, we've got to hold fast to that. When it comes to the sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross for our sins, we hold fast to that. When it comes to the Trinity, we hold tight to that. When it comes to who God is and what He is like and what He's doing in the world, we've got to hold on to that, right? Those are non-negotiables. Those aren't things we can argue over. Those aren't things that we can change on. No, those are what we hold fast to and what we build our life on. Amen. See, strong theology is the key to a strong life. And here's the truth. We are all theologians. The question is whether or not you're a good one, 
right? Uh, the question is whether or not do you believe what the Bible says or do you not, right? We're all called to love the Lord with our hearts and with our souls and with our what? With our minds, right? And so we've got to hold fast to strong theology because that's the key to a strong life. See, a high view of God is what sustains us when everything else crumbles. See, when your life gets hard, when your life starts to crumble around you, then the key to surviving that is not to look at your circumstances, it's to look at your Savior, right? The key to that is not to look at everything that's going on around us and think, oh, no, no, the key is to look and know that God is in control, right? And that if God is in control, then whatever's happening, it, it, it's going to hurt and it's not going to be fun. But it means that ultimately that if God wins, then I win, right? And we know that God wins. Now he ends verse five with this one baptism. Now he's not talking about the way that they're baptized or that you can only be baptized once. What he's saying is that we've all received the same baptism. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, uh, Paul talks about this. He talks about the baptism of the one baptism and the one spirit. He's saying that we've been baptized into the church and we've been given the one spirit. And so now we must be united. Now, Paul runs through this list of ones, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And here in verse six, the argument reaches the highest point that we have one God and one father of all. This is a summary of his argument in verses four and five. This one God invites all people to know him and to be forgiven. He's powerful. This is why Paul says there at the end of verse six, that he is over all, he is through all, he is in all. If you remember back to our series that we did over the summer on uh, awesome God, that God is omnipotent and he's omnipresent. He's all powerful and he is all powerful in all places. This is the God who brings unity to the church. See, it's because of who God is that unity is so important to the church. Because here's the thing, a divided church says something fundamentally untrue about our God. See, our church must be one because our God is one. See, the Trinity, maybe you don't understand it, right? I, I think that all of us have questions about the Trinity, but the Trinity is a tri-unity, is a unity of three in one. See, our God, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the perfect picture of unity. And what we know as we read the New Testament, and really as we read the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that God's people are called to be like him. In Leviticus, he says, be holy just as I am holy. In 1 Peter, Peter's going to pick that up and he's going to say, hey, church, be holy as God is holy. And what we see is that holiness is impossible where division is found. See, holiness is impossible apart from God-centered unity in the church. Amen. So to maintain this unity, we pray and we remember the gospel. In other words, we depend on God. See, without a big vision of God, real unity is impossible. See, we can try to build unity on ministries. We can try to build unity on worship styles. We can try to build unity on the way that we dress, the way that we look, all of that. And here's the thing, all of that will ultimately fail. All of that cannot bear to, to stand our unity. Now, are ministries good? Absolutely. Are we called to worship? Does it matter? Absolutely. But our unity is built not on those things. Our unity is built on God. Because there's one thing in this world that we can guarantee will never fail us, and it's God, right? He is where we build our unity. If we're going to be a united church, then we have got to be a God-centered church, right? Our prayer should be that central church keeps God central, right? If someone asks, why are we called central church? It's not because we're centrally located. It's because God is central to all that we do, right? All that we say, all that we are. So here in Ephesians 4, Paul gives us what does unity look like? Where does unity come from? See, the church and the church's unity is ultimately a gospel issue. 
Because the church is called to make the gospel visible in our community. We're called to demonstrate, to show, to put on display God's power working in us. And see, division in the church, it doesn't magnify God's power, but it highlights our sin, right? It it, it highlights where we are living for ourselves rather than for God and his glory. And so as members of the body, we strive for unity. We strive to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We love one another. We humble ourselves. We believe the gospel. See, this kind of unity is only possible when hearts and lives are changed by the gospel. See, a heart that has never been changed by the gospel can never know the joy of real unity because real unity starts with being united to Christ. See, unity is a fruit of the spirit, in my opinion. Right, the, the, when we've been changed by the gospel, is the spirit works in us, then he works to unite us one to another, right? We have been reconciled to the father, but we've also been reconciled to one another. And so if there is division in our ranks, if there's division between you and another brother or between you and another sister, then what has happened is that somewhere along the way, we have decided to stop believing the gospel and start believing a lie, right? Because a unity is where the Lord always leads us, right? He leads us to be united with Christ. And if we've been united with Christ, then we'll be united with his bride. Right, we'll be united with the church. But when there's division amongst us, it would be like you coming to me and saying, Ethan, I really like you and I really like your wife, except for her left hand really annoys me, right? <laughs> right that, that would be ridiculous. See, the gospel creates unity. And, and you can't know the joy of real unity apart from the gospel. Now, maybe, maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here in the room and you've never trusted Jesus to save you. Maybe you've never believed the gospel. And maybe you'd say, but Ethan, I, I know what unity is like. Well, I would respectfully disagree. Because real unity is found first and foremost in Jesus Christ. And then he motivates us. He empowers us by his spirit to be united with other people. And so so maybe you say, Ethan, I I want a little bit more, right? I want to know about this gospel that that can can unite me in a new way and in a different way. You've come to the right place. See, the way that God has united us to himself and the way that he's united the church one to another is by providing Jesus, his son, as a perfect sacrifice, Right? It is living a perfect life, a life that you and I have failed to live. And then in our place, Jesus went to the cross, an ancient form of execution, and he died in our place. And what the Bible says is that God's wrath for sin was poured out on him. And so now by Jesus's stripes, we've been healed. Right? By his blood, we've been washed clean of our sin. But it doesn't end there, right? Jesus is buried and three days later, just like he said he would, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and conquering death. And that resurrection, what the resurrection did was it proved that his sacrifice was acceptable and pleasing to the Father. And then what Jesus says is that if you will believe in him, if you will respond by putting your faith and your hope and your trust in him, then you can be, get this, united with him. And if you're united with Christ, then you are a joint heir with him. And so that means that all of his benefits are yours and all of your liabilities are his, right? This is the great exchange that Jesus takes our sin and he gives us his holiness, right? He he gives us his grace. He gives us his righteousness. And when that happens, then you and I can live forever in eternity, united to him. But get this, in eternity, we're not just united to him, we're united to one another, right? Thanks again for listening to today's message. Again, we hope that this message blessed you in some way. Now you've come to church, go be the church. Have a great week of worship.